to us. All of our deacons, our brothers and our sisters, it's good to be here. Amen. The land of the dying on our way to the land of the living. I'm certain that you've stopped today to say to the Lord, thank you for him bringing us safe this far. Didn't have to wake us this morning, but he did. That alone is enough to be thankful for. I'm so humbled to be here at the Lily Grove Church to be with my friend, Dr. Anderson, which is without a doubt one of God's greatest preachers. Uh, God has used him in such a mighty, marvelous way, and many times you can see how much God loved you based upon who he put over you to lead you. And evidently he's in love with the Lily Grove Church because he has placed a giant before you and it does not yet appear what God will do with this ministry through the leadership of this great preacher. I enjoy hearing him preach. He came to Salem and preached and on the reason he's not pastor there, I wouldn't let him hold an election. <laughs> uh, he came and tried to take our little church. And so, and I am honored to be here with him. And they see Dr. Williams in the house tonight. Amen. Thank God for him. Amen. And to listen to this choir, my goodness, did they not bless us? They not only sound good, but they look good. And then these beautiful ushers, thank God for the ushers. Amen. I tell our church, never put an ugly usher at the door. They will, they will run more people away than you can ever preach in. Let me get started. <clears throat> all of these preachers, so delighted to see all of them in the house tonight. Psalms 23. <clears throat> Psalms 23. Verse 4, Psalms 23, verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod, thy staff, they comforted me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Whatever, whatever subject you want to use with that would be all right with me and just, just tell me about it later. The three words in, in this verse I want to put emphasis on. It's a yea, though, which is a conjunction. I walk through, which is a preposition, for thou, which is a pronoun. This conjunction, preposition, and pronoun. I am so serious about the word until I, 
I make sure that I don't take it for granted. There's, there's always at least several ways of approaching any text in the Bible. That's what you call topical teaching. Topical teaching is when you think of an idea you like and you go to the scripture to find a text to match your subject. <clears throat> what we normally do with that is isogete the text instead of exegete, which means you read into the text your own belief instead of pulling from the text what the Holy Spirit has deposited into the text. As, as quiet as it is kept, you can make the Bible say what you want it to say. I can actually show you in the Bible where it's right to kill yourself. Matthew chapter 27 verse 5, the Bible said Judas went and hung himself. Luke 10, 37, Jesus said go and do likewise. <clears throat> John 13, 27 said, what you do, do quickly. <laughs> because many times when we approach the text, we don't come empty-handed. We bring baggage to the text. We come to the text with our own preconceived ideas, things we picked up from other folk, stuff we heard from songs, some we got from unbiblical literature. Uh, we, we bring baggage to the text. Our culture set in when we read the Bible. Uh, it, it, as quiet as it is kept, our culture play a great role in what we see when we read. White America can see the same passage you see and see something totally different. They sing the song, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. We sing the same song, but don't call the roll till I get there. <laughs> so we have to be careful with textual teaching and uh, topical teaching. Textual teaching is always wonderful because uh, you teach what you see right before you. But even at textual teaching, sometimes you can error because the Bible was written in its original Hebrew and Greek languages. And it was changed to our King James modern language. In the Hebrew and Greek languages, there are 12,000 words in the Bible. In our English translation, there are only 6,000 words. Meaning that when it was translated from the original Hebrew Greek to our English language, they had to duplicate some words to put 12,000 in the six which mean that you will see some words that spell the same way but have different meanings. Uh, Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and spake of them, said all power. The Greek word is exorcia, which mean authority. Acts 1 and 8 say ye shall receive power. Spell the same way, but the Greek word is dunamis, where you get the word dynamite. Ephesians 6 and 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power. The Greek word is kratos, that's demonstrative power. It's spelled the same way but have different meanings. 
For instance, there's a passage in the Bible that's in all three of synoptic writers. It's when Mary comes to Jesus and she washes his feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. It looked like from the textual standpoint that Mary just showed up and started crying and had enough tears to wash the feet of Jesus. But when you look at it from the culture standpoint, you know in that day they carried with them tear bottles. That every time they would cry, they would catch the tears and put in a bottle. If they was grieving, they would catch grieving tears. If the hearts was broken, they would catch broken hearted tears. Mary's tear bottle filled up. And once a, a tear bottle filled up, she found Jesus. And when she found Jesus, she poured all of her tears at his feet. Meaning she was pouring all of her problems at the feet of Jesus. And then then that's, that's what you call expository teaching. Expository teaching deal with interpretation, which means you find out what the Bible is saying. It then deal with investigation, you find out what it means. And then it deal with application, you find out how you fit into the text. Because whenever you read the Bible, it is like standing in front of a mirror. And when you stand in front of a mirror, you don't see the person down the street. You see the one standing in the mirror. And because of that, every word is important. Every comma is important. Every question mark is important. Every semicolon is important. For instance, whenever you see a comma, it means rest period. Second Chronicle chapter 4 verse 8 says, we're trouble on every side, comma. That means when God sends trouble, he lets you rest before he sends some more trouble. <laughs> so, so, so we're trouble on every side, comma, yet not in distress, semicolon. <laughs> semicolon is used in place of a period, which means a long extended period of time. Mean that when God sends trouble in your life, he give you a long rest period before he sends some more trouble. Whenever you see a question mark, only you can answer that. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. Psalms 116, verse 12. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? <laughs> now, can't nobody answer that but you. Because don't nobody know what God has done for you but you. Whenever there's an explanation mark, the word prior to that should be emphasized louder. For instance, Matthew 23, 23, warned you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. Right after word hypocrite, that's an explanation mark. It should read like this, woe unto you scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites. It said, for you pay tithes, mint, or nis, and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. This ye ought to have done, and not leave the other undone. Here's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying during his day, tithing was so common, till even hypocrites were tithing. <laughs> but here's what he's also saying. When you fail to tithe, you fail to equal up. <laughs> to a hypocrite. <laughs> Am I putting y'all to sleep in here? And because of that, words are important. Scholars, scholars say when you study the Bible that you seek the verbs in the text because the verb is where the action is. For instance, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6, there are four verbs in that verse. It said, when the woman saw, that's verb number one, the tree to be desired, to make one wise, she took, that's verb number two. She did eat, that's verb number three, and she gave, that's verb number four. A look became a lust. A desire became a decision. A choice became a chain. 
a sinner became a seducer. Talk to me, somebody. Ver verbs are important. They also say you should seek out the subjects of the text because when you find the subject in the text, you find out what the pensman had in mind when he penned what he penned. And when you find a sinners with no subject, you become the subject. <laughs> Talk to me somebody. Because Ephesians chapter 5 verse 18, be not drunk with wine where is an excess, be filled with the spirit. And since there's no subject in there, who should be filled? <laughs> You, talk to me somebody, should be filled. But we must also watch the conjunctions in the text. Conjunctions in the text is like the cement between the brick walls. When we look at the bricks, that we watch the bricks, but we pay the cement no attention. But it's the cement between the walls that keep the bricks in order. It is the conjunctions in the text that keep the centers flowing and in order. And there are different kinds of conjunctions, and I rush to the text. That's what you call a contrast conjunction, which means the sentence is going in one way, but when you get to the conjunction, it will send you another way. For instance, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but gift of God is eternal life. It sends you another way. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1, 2, 3, and 4 reads like this. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness have come up before me. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to flee unto Tasha, went down the Joppa, found a ship going to Tasha, paid his fare there are, went down with them unto Tasha from the presence of the Lord. Verse 4, but God that when your butt head in one direction, God got another butt to send you another way. And it's a conjunction, but it is a connecting conjunction. It connects what has just happened to what's getting ready to happen. For instance, John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father that he will send another comforter. Now, all three of the Godheads is in John 14, 16, and I, that's the Son, will pray the Father, that's the Father, that he will send another comforter, that's the Holy Ghost. It is the Son who prays, the Father to whom he pray, the Holy Ghost for whom he pray. He said, listen, you can have all three, but there's a conjunction connected there. And a matter of fact, the conjunction connect the promise with the principle. Most of us, we like to ride in on the promises of God, but we try to violate the principle. If you don't apply the principle, you will not experience the promise. Preach from Ray. <laughs> and the principle is in verse 15. Watch this. If you love me, keep my commandments. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. <laughs> now, if you abide by 15, 16 is a sure win. <laughs> if is a conjunction, but it's a conditioning conjunction, which means it's based upon how you respond. <laughs> Matter of fact, if you're still in John 14, if you back up to verse 14, he said, if you ask anything in my name, he said, I'll do it. <laughs> are are y'all here? <laughs> He says, all just, if you just ask in my name. I, I like it because when God answered prayer, he approaches it different from anything else. Because sometimes when God gets ready to bless us, he sends other folk to do it for us. When, when he got ready to bless Israel, he sent Abraham. When he got ready to lead Israel, he sent Moses. When he got ready to march Israel, he sent Joshua. When he wanted a fighter for Israel, he sent Samson. When he wanted wisdom for Israel, he sent Solomon. When he wanted a singer, he sent David. When he wanted patience, he sent Job. When he wanted vision, he sent Isaiah. When he wanted a weeper, he sent Jeremiah. When he wanted a prayer, he sent John. Talk to somebody. 
But when he get ready to answer our prayer, he don't send nobody. He show up himself. That will I do. Therefore. Therefore is a conjunction. Whenever you see therefore, if you back up a little, it'll tell you what it's there for. Ah, <laughs> uh, y'all don't hear me. I got to rush to the text. That is a conjunction in verse 4. It says, yay. So, here's what the psalmist is saying. He said, listen, the Lord can be your shepherd. You can be grazing in green pastures. You can be positioned by still water. So you can be so good until your soul has already been restored. So you can actually be in the path of righteousness and still have to encounter a valley. <laughs> T -t Too many times we think we are excluded from valleys. But can I tell you there's a valley somewhere with your name on it. Yeah, it, it, it's there, and, 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 and whenever the valleys show up, you, you have several choices. You can act like it doesn't exist. You can say, I'm not going to claim it. <laughs> Talk to me, somebody. But if it's there, you may well go and claim it. If it's there, <laughs> just accept the reality of the valley because valleys they are ordered by the Lord Psalms 37 verse 23 said the steps of a good man they are ordered by the Lord the, the Lord he select our valleys he, he measure our valleys but I like it because he also control our valleys. That's some things you will never learn in life until you get in your valley. Because number one, your valley will show you who your friends are. <laughs> You got all these little fellas talking about, I'm your friend, I'm your buddy. They hadn't seen you in the valley yet. No, no, you, you'll find out who your real friends are. When you get, as a matter of fact, you can count all your friends on one hand. And have two or three fingers left over. <laughs> Valleys will help you to know who you are. Because sometimes we don't know ourselves. Always good not to say what I, I ain't going to never do. Maybe you ain't been in a valley yet. If you've been in a valley, you do a whole lot of stuff you said you would never do. Matter of fact, person don't want you to know it. The reason they in here tonight. Because they've been in a valley. <laughs> Valleys will send you to church. Valleys will have you on your knees. 
Valleys will have you reading Bible at two in the morning. Do I have a witness? Valleys help you find out who God is. Because sometimes we act like we know him. You don't really know him until you've been through some stuff. And, and people respond different based upon where they are. You can get this podium and put three pots of hot water here. Put three different items in the, in the water and get three different results. Get one pot of hot water, put an egg in it. Hot water will make it hard. Get another pot of hot water and put vegetables in it. Hot water will make it soft. Get another pot of hot water and put coffee in it. It will flavor the house. Get some people and put them in hot water, they get hard. They become hateful. Low down. Connivers. Put some folk in hot water, they get soft. They crawl up in a corner somewhere and start singing the blues. But you can put some folk in hot water. They'll flavor the house. They will say, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. Do I have a witness? God selects certain people. He can trust with trouble. He can't trust everybody with trouble. Some of them, if you go through what your friend has gone through, talk to me, somebody. You take a gun and blow your brains out. But the others can say, though you slay me, Yet will I trust in you. Do I have a witness? Accept the reality of the valley. Secondly, I need to announce my response. Since I'm in there, what am I going to do? Text said that's three things you need to do. Number one, he said I'm going to walk. Now, some people would prefer run. Let me run through it and get over it as soon as I can. Lord said, no, no. When you run, you make too many mistakes. When you run, you fall fast. He said, but walk. Because when you walk, you can see more. And anytime God puts you in a valley, he wants you to see something. Somebody ought to talk to him in his house. He wants you to see, and sometimes it takes some of us a long time to see it. Some people can see it as soon as you get in there. Others, it take years to be able to see it. He said, I'm going. That was by walking, I'm not standing still. But walking, it means I'm moving forward. Maybe slow, but I'm moving. But walking also means I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Y'all don't like me tonight. But walking also means I'm leaving some folk behind me. See, everybody that started with you, it was not designed for them to stay. You trying to carry somebody with you that's trying to carry you down. Don't let nobody 
park on your mind. And they're not paying you any rent. You got to write them an eviction notice. Say you can't park here. Uh, I'm going. I'm going. I'm going. I'm a walk. Do I have a witness? In other words, I'm gonna keep on serving him. Thing gonna look good for me, but I'm gonna keep serving. The skin lies my name, but I'm gonna keep serving him. <laughs> Doctor said, don't look good, but I'm gonna keep serving. Talk to me, somebody. Don't feel good this morning, but I'm keep on serving. Do I have a witness here? Uh, Romans 8:30. Seven said we're more than conquerors. Hoop and the cow, the Greek word for conqueror is a compound word. Hooper mean under. It means, yeah, under. The cow means to conquer. It comes from the idea of people in the Olympic race, they would scale the mountains. Some would fall by the wayside. Some would get almost to the top and quit. But if you made it to the top, they would raise your hand and say, you are a conqueror. They go back down. Next time they put a load on them. Go back up that mountain. Some would fall under the pressure of the load. Some would get almost there and quit. So I give up. But if he made it to the top with a load on, they'd raise your hand and say, you're more than a conqueror. Some people do all right if they ain't got no load. But can you make it with a load on you? I got any help in this house, huh? Yeah. Number one, I'm going to walk. Secondly, I'm not going to fear. Fear messes you up. Fear cancel visions. Fear make you turn in your resume. Fear Give your ulcer in the stomach. Fear put tears in your eyes. Fear will fix it where you don't hear what you need to hear. Fear will have your knees knocking. Talk to me somebody. Fear and faith don't rest in the same heart. If fear is there, faith ain't there. If faith is there, fear is not there. Talk to me, somebody. We walk not by sight, but by faith. You see, 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 sight will have you filling out an application, applying for a job, but faith will have you cashing your first check. Sight will have you applying for a student loan, but faith will have you walking the stage getting your degree. Sight will have you applying for a home loan, but faith will have you moving in the house. Sight will have you going up for surgery, but faith will have you back home healed. <laughs> have I got any help in this house? Uh, and, and, and there's 365 fear knots in the Bible. And I don't know if you know it or not, but that's 365 days in the year. So there's a fear knot. For every day of the week. So I ain't got to save today's fear not till tomorrow. I can use my day's fear not. And when tomorrow come, I got to fear not for tomorrow. Do I have a witness number one? I'm going to walk. 
Number two, I'm not going to fear. But number three, I'm going through. I didn't make it up. It's right in the text. Huh? Now, some folk, when they tell you, pray for them, I'm going through. But that's good. That means I ain't going to stay where I am now. Because remember, yea, though I walk through, talk to me somebody, it's a preposition. A. Lewis Patterson said preposition is a preposition. Which means where I'm now is not where I'm going to end up. See, folks try to tell you that that's a period in your life. It ain't no period, it's a comma. Talk to me, somebody. And come and mean I'm pausing, not parking. Y'all don't like me. Jude, Jude 24 said, now, well, normally, now is an adverb, but in Jude 24, it's a conjunction. Now, <laughs> unto, which is a preposition, prepossession. And then him, which is a pronoun, but it's an objective pronoun. Next word is that, which is a pronoun, but it's a subjective pronoun. In the English language, it's rare that you have objective and subjects together. It's either of, never both in. And, and so I had some problem with it, so I decided to look at it from the Greek text. And it read like this, all that stuff ain't even in there. It just said, him able. Look at somebody tell them, him evil. I don't care what you're going through. Him. Him. I got to leave y'all. I've held you long enough. Number one. Accept the reality of the valley. Then announce my response in the valley. But finally, I must acknowledge my resources. Because I'm not in there by myself. I've got some resources. It's that for thou. Anytime you find text with tension in the text, you can back up or go forward. The Bible will explain itself. Let's go up to verse 5. Thou preparing a table. There he is there. Let's back up to verse 3. He restoring my soul. He lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Let's back up to verse 2. He make me lie down in green pastures. He lead me beside still water. Let's back up to one, the Lord. There he is, the Lord. You know him, don't you? That came from nowhere, stood on the platform of nothing, reached back to nowhere and caught something while standing on nothing. The Lord that, that painted the sky blue without using a stepladder. The Lord took an eternal brush and painted a rainbow in the sky. Took the rainbow, weaved it over the shoulders of a dying stone. The Lord that gave the hyena his laugh, gave the dog his bark, gave the worm its wiggle, gave the bee its buzz. The Lord that tied a bow tie around the turkey's neck. The Lord uh, that taught the kangaroo how to hop. <laughs> the Lord uh, that whispered in the ear of the wild geese. Tell them when to leave the North Pole. Uh, 
and give them landing rights down south. He said, Thou art with me. Have I got a witness here? Now you know the Lord changes his position whenever you get in trouble. As long as things are going well, he's leading us. In verse 2, he lead me beside still water. In verse 3, he lead me in the path of righteousness. When I get it really together, he get behind me. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me. But when I get in my valley, he's not ahead of me, nor is he behind me, but he's right with me. Yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Can I tell you what that mean? Uh, that mean in my valley, I got the Lord's presence. <laughs> Shout present one time. <laughs> if you got his presence, uh, who can mess with you? <laughs> if you're in the presence of the Lord, uh, if you have his presence, uh, what demon uh, can override you? Uh, what sickness uh, can take you out? Uh, what crook? Uh, can destroy you just his presence alone is enough but if I got his presence I got his protection he got all power don't have a witness here he got all I gotta quit y'all got all power in his hand uh, not on his present uh, not on his protection uh, yeah I got his power and then I have uh, his promise uh, listen to what he said uh, I will never leave you nor will I forsake you come hell or high water the God said uh, won't he walk with you won't he hold your hand won't he guide your feet do I have a witness here I'm out of here I've held you long enough you know in the English language that's three person the first person the second person the Third person, first person is the one that's talking. Second person is the one he's talking to. Third person is the one he's talking about. In verse two, he's in the third person. He make me lie down in green pastures. He lead me beside still water. In verse three, he's in the third person. He restore my soul. He lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. But in verse four, he's in the second person. For thou are with me here it is and I'm out of here as long as you're on the hill you're talking about the Lord as long as you in green pastures you're talking about him as long as you're on the right path you're talking about him but when you get in your valley instead of talking about him you start talking to him just shake one hand say neighbor i got one thing to tell you oh just a, a little talk with jesus oh won't he make everything 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 hallelujah 
Hallelujah. Look at somebody. I promise I got to go. Catch him by the hand just one moment. Say, neighbor, you're standing right by me. But you don't know all the hell I had to go through lately. So I had to go through hell and high water. But tell him, neighbor, the reason you don't know about it, tell me because I don't look like what I've been through. Out of all the stuff I've had to go through, I still have my joy. And all this joy, all this joy, all this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me.